Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. I'm Tony Kopechny. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Parsons TKO. For anyone who doesn't know us yet, we are the engagement architecture firm. And recently we have launched a new research arm of the company that we're calling the Data Innovation Studio. As part of that, we've been having conversations for a while now about the role of data ethics in the mission-driven sector. Um, we realize the term itself, data ethics, is quite broad. Uh, you know, so today we're starting with one angle on it. But what we're really hoping to create by your attendance here, your interest in this event, is to build a community of practice within the mission-driven sector where we can start having dialogues about data ethics more broadly. And we really do want to hear from you, you know, which angles on data ethics are of most interest, most concern, or impacting your day-to-day -day work. Because as we build the series of these conversations, we want to make sure we're addressing those uh, issues within the community that you're feeling. And as such, too, after this event, we're going to send you information about a LinkedIn network that we're going to build to keep this dialogue going to try to get more people into the conversation with us about data ethics moving forward. Um, I think it really will be the community of practice that we create in the mission-driven sector. And by we, I mean all of us, not Parsons TKO, everyone involved in this discussion of how we can really think about what we're doing with the data, how we're using it to really move the mission forward and in an ethical manner. Uh, which really matters to all of us that are working for a mission. So I am absolutely delighted and humbled to introduce my colleague, Chelsea Louis, who will be our moderator and main discussant for today's conversation. Chelsea, as I noted, she's one of the uh, folks here in the company that's driving the new research arm, the Data Innovation Studio for us. Thank you for that, Chelsea. Uh, and thank you for uh, bringing this topic to us and, and creating this, this event series with us. Uh, Chelsea is a recent graduate of California Polytechnic State uh, University of San Luis Obispo. And she is also the co-founder of the Student Founded Activism Always, which is how we met Chelsea. So without further ado, Chelsea, thank you so much. And to all the panelists, um, this is gonna be a great conversation. Thank you so much for your time today. It really means a lot uh, to us that you, you take the time to come and have this conversation with us. And one more thing before I turn to Chelsea, everyone, please feel free, use the chat, uh, talk in that chat channel. If you've got ideas, put them in that chat channel. If you want to talk to each other privately, go ahead and use the chat channel. But whatever you're putting in there, you know, think that's the first way we can start to get a sense of what's on your mind when it comes to data ethics as well. So again, thank you everyone and Chelsea. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, Tony, for that introduction. Um, hi, I'm Chelsea. I'll be um, the main moderator for today's event and I'm very, very excited um, to be introducing this topic with Parsons TKO, um, and also to introduce our amazing uh, group panelists today. So um, I'll start by just giving a brief intro about the amazing people that we have um, to discuss about this topic of data ethics and storytelling with us. Um, we have Arabella DeLuca, who's a founder and CEO of WeXL uh, at WeXL.org. Um, Arabella is a creative with um, extensive experience from journalism to marketing, um, and right now with WeXL, they're really trying to bring diverse voices to media and communications and storytelling work. Um, so I think she's going to have a wonderful perspective to share with us there. Um, we also have Robert Kruger, who's, who's the executive communications manager at Gensler. Um, he is also the incoming president for the Public Relations Society of America's national um, chapter. National Capital Chapter, um, and he does a lot of work in the communications field um, with the communications board and is also the founder of Comms Fest. Um, and our third speaker today is going to be Jamie, um, who has really been building and scaling programs in the social impact sector um, and has been working um, to bring innovative technologies and think about innovative ways to use data um, to help um, mission-driven organizations, um, from organizations to share our strength to Greenpeace, and really thinking about these topics in depth. Um, so this is our amazing panel that I'm very, very excited um, to, to have speak with you all today. Um, a few things to kind of frame what we're doing, Tony's already kind of touched on it, um, that Person CKO, we really see that thinking about data and ethics and these sort of underlying sort of values and morals and themes is really important to um, technology work. It's something that is sometimes overlooked or sometimes that is seen as part of like a package. Um, but we think that this is something that we really should discuss on the forefront. 
Um, so today we're really looking at the subjective and different perspectives of our panelists. Um, we're not trying to facilitate any discussion that is uh, supposedly a debate, um, but we're really trying to bring out those perspectives um, and to share that uh, with you all today. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, get the conversation started. I'm going to stop uh, screen sharing um, so we can see our panelists' lovely faces. Uh, and we'll get right there. Um, panelists, feel free to unmute. Um, and yeah, feel free to uh, begin chatting. Um, so the first question I want to bring to you all today is um, sort of what drew you to be interested in the subject of data and of storytelling, um, either or and also together in the form of data storytelling. Um, and sort of what what is data ethics to you? What is data storytelling to you? Yeah, I mean, I think I can kind of start. Um, so I come from the field of communications and public relations. And so uh, 15 years ago, data really wasn't that big in PR. It was still it was still a lot of, you know, get your story placed, you know, and those uh, uh, those, those um, top tier publications. Um, and I think like over with the introduction of technology and you know the our, our access to it as PR and communications and uh, professionals to that technology, um, we've had to you know really kind of develop this, these sets of ethics around that um, around data. Um, I teach um, and I've, I've taught uh, at the university level, the West Virginia and, and University of Florida, courses on measurement and data. And, um, and, and it's funny because always there's always a unit on ethics. And I think that those conversations revolve around, um, they don't necessarily revolve around kind of like around what you probably think, like the use of data, like how we use other people's data that we capture. Um, that's what tends to get the most like attention, I think. But in what we're, what PR professionals and communicators deal with day in, day in and day out is how we use that data for data-driven storytelling, like how if we're manipulating it <laughs> as part of our stories or our infographics or data visualizations, are we cherry picking it um, unethically? Um, but also how we um, how we use it with our clients and our executives. Um, and I think that, you know, we, we're always, I think we've, when we present a campaign and like we post campaign, you know, of course we're always like, yeah, this was this campaign, look at the data, you know, okay, but of course, we pick that data, um, and I don't think we necessarily manipulate it or not. But um, we definitely uh, we choose what we present, present, and we choose what we do not present. Um, I think a good example it's just for those that want to hear it in PR, like share a voice, is like is like this metric. And for those you don't know what it is, it's like so in PR, it's like you know, okay, we're going to benchmark against our three competitors, and who gets the most mentions in the media has the biggest market share around you know, in our industry. And so there are ways to kind of <laughs> manipulate, like if you have like scission or whatever, uh, you can track that, your your media mentions. Um, and so I used to work for an organization and we would we would choose which would we present based on who the audience was. And like, and for example, um, if you issued like a, like a, a newswire press release, your automatic, that, that press release is automatically picked up by hundreds of web, web news websites that's really not like earned media. That's really, kind of, I mean, they're picking you up and all that, but like, and there was a way to filter those out, you know, filter out uh, newswire mentions. Um, but depending on who you're talking to, you might be like, well, look, you know, we got, you know, our market share is bigger. Um, where in, in actuality, you know, if you're talking to someone else, you know, you might present a, a different um, a market share uh, uh, pie chart. And so those are some of the things that, you know, in my world, we, we deal in day in and day out. And I, and I think the majority of them are, majority of us are honest and all that, but like you, when you see that information, it's tempting. Right. And so, um, cause we're all human. Yeah. I think, you know, on the journalism side of things, because I, I was a newspaper reporter, as Chelsea had mentioned, um, my first job out of college, I was actually a newspaper reporter right in college, right in my senior year. And um, and it was really interesting because back then, I'm dating myself, 2003, there was, there was still a print newspaper. 
And there were editors in the newsroom that helped you develop your story and helped you choose what stories we should be telling from the community. And they really helped you as a, me personally, as a new reporter, as a, as a green reporter to understand what stories we should be telling. And it helped me be more objective. But then as, as my career progressed, I ended up in marketing for tech and in marketing and tech, it's all about, you know, what is, what is actually making an impact to the audience or the user base that you want to target? How are they signing up to your platform and, and using your, 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 your product? And it's so different. And I, you know, in, in about, what was it like maybe 10 years ago, BuzzFeed started writing more sensationalized um, uh, clickbait uh, headlines and it would it would get it would get clicks so you know and then as as a, as content creation gets more and more democratized and newsrooms get get more and get sh just shrink more and more or get acquired by larger um, you know publications and you have like more homogeny or you have like this inability to tell a story objectively uh, because you're a one-man band. So I, I was personally drawn to this um, conversation because I've been a storyteller across the board and I've used data across the board for, for understanding what is going to get more, more engagement. But at the end of the day, I realized that we as human beings are always in control of what we put out, regardless of what gets clicked more. So I like what you said, Robert, with, you know, most people are ethical. Most people are trying to do the ethical thing, but sometimes it gets a little bit scary and it's like, oh, I'm kind of drawn. I'm kind of drawn to do it this way because you want, you want the impressions, you want the engagement. And especially if you're working for a client and in a service industry, you need those results. I'll just add from where I sit today and also in my previous roles when working in the, you know, in the nonprofit industry itself. I agree with Arabella and Robert when it comes to most people are ethical when they're, you know, using their data. I think where it becomes tricky is when you are cherry picking what data you use from us and nonprofits have to walk this tightrope of proving their impact and worth, and at the same time, continuing to have a drumbeat of how big and uh, uh, and how big the problem is. And sometimes it almost feels like you have this dichotomy of how you're using your data, right? Uh, to funders, you're like, look at everything we've done. Look at all the look at all these great percentages of impact. And then at the same time, you're going back to a lot of those donors in a month or two and saying, look how big the problem is. We need more money to solve the problem. And so it's just a very interest. It's how do you tell a story that continue? I think nonprofits face an issue of how do you tell a true story while continuing to prove your organization's worth, but also need? And it can become a very difficult and convoluted story to tell. And um, I also was really drawn to this conversation to talk about why people aren't telling stories because the data is convoluted or complicated or isn't sharing or telling a story that fits into the narrative that they're needing or perceive that they need to share. And how do you come to terms with that and find a way around that in a way where you can still maintain your ethics? Um, yeah. I like how you, Jamie, you were saying, you know, you on the other, uh, both you and Robert talked about like the use of data in the actual storytelling. And I talk about the use of data behind the scenes of like, what stories should you tell? Um, for me, you know, um, having been trained as a journalist, I feel like I can't help it. I, I just have to give numbers straight through. I, and, and that's just, it is. It's just, this is, these are the numbers. I mean, you know, there's not a lot of people giving to, to we excel right now because even, so the, in terms of like our impact numbers are, 
are, are small because we're a small nonprofit. So the way we we circumvent that and because we're small and uh, we just show the stories. It's like straight from our communities, you know, um, experience with us and how we change their lives. And then we just, we go from there because we can't manipulate the numbers because as we are growing, you know, we, we need, it's it's like the, you know, the chicken or the egg. I mean, I listen to you and you're like, oh, nonprofits, fundraising. I'm like, oh my goodness, it's so hard. But, you know, we, 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 um, we just realized this, this week that we're actually going to take away our social enterprise component of the nonprofit because we provide storytelling tell, tell, through DEI lens to corporations. And what was happening is it's actually ending up cannibalizing our mission. And we really need to just focus on our community. And that's, that's um, you know, that's using data um, in just like business versus just versus storytelling. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Arabella, because it's, it, it, people look at numbers. I'll give you an example to just on the same, in the same vein of that. So when I worked at a, when I worked at a crisis intervention suicide hotline, you know, we, we, there was a time, um, 2008, great recession where we were getting an influx of calls. And so the number of calls we were answering was dropping, right? Cause we were a volunteer organization and volunteers only can answer so many calls. So what that looks like can be the story that tells with just displaying data can, can be perceived in so many ways. You're not performing, you're hanging people out to dry, you're not answering the calls for need, or you need more people, we need more funding, we need more phones, we need more support. And unless you have a strong storyteller to your point behind what, like what you just said, Arabella, if there was no storyteller that could take that data, the same data point and fit a narrative around it that really gets to the true core of the issue, you, you could lose everything, right? Funders could drop, competitors could come in, uh, it, the credibility of your organization and its impact could go down the tubes. And so, you know, it's really also important it's like this, again, it's this conflict. It's like, you can, you know, do you not share a story? And if the data gets out there some other way, is the story, do you lose control of that story? Or do you take the risk of telling that story in a way that you get to set the narrative and hope that it resonates and that people receive that right message? And I think these are things that our, our organizational leaders face every day and make these calculated risks on how, what stories are they going to tell? How are they going to tell them in a way that resonates with people and uh, furthers their mission? And it, um, it's uh, the leader's responsibility, it's the board's responsibility, and it's the communications team responsibility to, you know, what Robert does is how do you, how do you take that data and uh, create that story that's going to really resonate with people in the right way? That's why you need Robert. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I told Robert he has a really hard job. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> I like I like what Jamie when you brought up like a second ago, like kind of like about nonprofits and funders and and kind of the use of data. I think that just coming from um, well, still very involved with nonprofits, um, that's always an issue. Like you know, like how do you communicate your your impact? You know, if this is like a new initiative, you know, you, you don't have the data yet. And so and then once you have it, how do you communicate that money actually made an impact that you that, that how do you communicate to your donors that there was value in what they gave that money to? And so um, and it, it's an ongoing issue because there, there are some periods where like a lot of that money goes to overhead, you know, it goes to like, you know, funding staff and like, you know, uh, so it, it takes a while to build out an initiative or program um, unless you have like, enough money right uh, up front. Um, I think that um, I think the way that we've like the, that I've gotten around it in the past and whenever we reach out to potential sponsors or partners um, is like really we kind of we communicate we use data from like lar a large showing like a larger trend a trend that's bigger than us bigger than our nonprofit you know and like how and like really just kind of like who's our network who's our who, who's the, our spheres of influence and how um and you know and and we use that kind of like that that data to kind of complement that that bigger data and so 
Um, I know there's like two different types of data. We always hear about big data, big data. And, you know, that's like I was saying, like that, that, that's the one that gets all the attention in the media. But there's also like small data. Yeah, that really you've been, your company has been doing for a long time. And so the big data makes no sense for a company. Like you can buy all the enterprise tools that you want, but that big data make, makes no sense if you don't complement it with the smaller data and vice versa, really. Like that small data has more value to complement it with the bigger data. And so I think that, you know, as as we kind of like, as no matter what our profession is, as, as like the, the tools and the access to data becomes more sophisticated, I think that we're just gonna have to like figure out, you know, how how that works with the data we've already been using. Um, and that'll impact like our storytelling and that, and obviously that's, you know, um, there, we have to make decisions about kind of like about what communicate, what sets of data we're communicating to what public and whatnot. Yeah, absolutely, Robert. Um, and I, I wanted to add in a point there as well, um, cause we're really talking about like the interrelationship between data and stories and about like where, where that line blurs, like, um, because a lot of the data is is really just sort of the evidence to prove our stories a lot of time. Um, and how we decide to tell the story based off of that evidence can change based on our goals, based on what we want to share from, um, from, from that piece. Um, I think I, I saw in chat that Stefan mentioned um, that analytics is storytelling um, because you're you're trying to to explain what is happening. Um, and I think a lot of times, as Robert mentioned, we're really focused on big data. We're thinking about like these huge numbers, these huge platforms um, in which all this um, data is aggregated. Um, but we forget about like the smaller pieces of data, the data that is um, sort of like native to your organization, or we forget about the qualitative pieces of data um, that are so often forgotten, thinking about like the culture in your community um, the individuals that you are, the, the stories that you're changing, like those pieces of stories, while not seen as maybe as impressive as a, a huge percentage increase, still has a lot of value in it. Um, so thinking about like those tensions between like, where is the line between the data we're collecting and the stories we're telling um, is, is an interesting theme. Um, yeah, just wanted to bring that up. Yeah, you know, Chelsea, I'm, I'm going to take it on a little macro level here um, that's not really in the nonprofit space, but I don't know if anyone's seen the um, reports on how Squid Games is now the, it's it's en route to being the, the most popular Netflix movie. <laughs> and, you know, when I, when I see this, and as a storyteller, and we do a lot of filmmaking at week, so I get a little nervous because... Um, we're going to see a lot more of Squid Games, and I mean, I, I've seen the trailer. I haven't seen, the, I haven't seen the movie, so just, just, <laughs> I'm not going to say that anything about the movie itself. But just the trailer itself was very scary, and and I, I was scared watching the trailer, and just our 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 the energy right now of the world after well, still we're still in a pandemic. It's just really we're. I see it all the time, but we're very, it's, it's like fear is in the air. And, and so I, I get worried that like, you know, such a powerful company like Netflix will seize that data and says, let's have more of that. And so just because like it's performing well, does it mean, does it mean that you should make more of that? And, and that's where I really love the nonprofit world because we're, we're driven by our mission, right? We're, we have a mission, it stays, it helps us, the mission helps us with a compass. It's our compass. The mission is our compass in ethics, right? If as long as you're serving your mission, you're okay. But Netflix doesn't have a mission, right? And it, and, and it's, and, it, and so it, I, I'm positive they're gonna be like, we want more of this, this, this type of content, um, which scares me, honestly. Scares me as well, and Arabelle, you made a quick point, and I, I will be in the in um, the spirit of being uh, transparent around data. I have not read the articles in full, but I know that one of the sound bites that came out of the Wall Street Journal article that they did that expose that on Facebook was uh, rage posts or angry posts get the most attention and they're raising them up in the algorithm. And so the stories that are being 
based on data, stories that are being promoted in the world of Facebook are ones that are perpetuating fear and anger and um, partisan type of experiences and, and conflict. And, you know, is that using data to tell stories ethically? Is that really what the world is like? Is that really what's going on with all of, you know, these issues that, and how they're bubbling them up? And so it makes a good point. And in turn is that minimizing the real data and the real stories of the good work and the happiness that's out there in the world. And, um, and is it perpetuating fear and anger instead of bringing everyone into a more unified understanding of really what are these systems that are at play and what is uh, really happening around these important issues that we're all facing together? Yeah, and this, this kind of touches on um, something that's already been mentioned is that most people, um, at least here, we, we believe people are trying to do the right thing that when seeing the data, when seeing the trends, people are trying to look at it in, a, in an ethical way, in a moral way that benefits society. That's, that's the assumption we're going in with. Um, and I think it's really difficult when there, um, as you mentioned, Jamie, there are systems at play that um, don't see that to their favor. Um, whether it be sort of like whatever algorithms out there that's pumping out more clicks, more views, um, these sort of metrics that don't really reflect um, sort of the broader sense of the mission that we want the world to be a better place. Um, so that's that's another tension that we think about when we think about data and storytelling. Um, and if, what are the goals of what we're trying to do with those metrics, with that data? And I think in the mission-driven space, uh, we try to think that like, we're being driven by a mission to make the world a better place, however it might be. Um, and in other spheres, that just might not be the case, whether it's there's a bottom line that we, we have to increase views in some way um, for us to sustain ourselves. Um, or even if there's a double bottom line where we need to sustain ourselves. And even if there are missions and values, sometimes that doesn't come into sort of the forefront. So I think a lot of times people are trying to do the right thing, but there are those things at play within a larger system. Um, yeah. I think also, you know, when it comes to a fundraising, the campaigns that get most funding are the ones that you feel bad. You feel like your, your heartstrings are not, um, are not, are, are tugged not because someone's doing something incredible and wonderful, but it's because you feel bad. And I think like, that's actually one of the things that we face um, at We Excel is that, you know, our, our storytelling is positive. And, and, and it's hard to say, oh, poor this person, poor that person, because it's like, no, we're, we're about like, uplifting diverse voices, right, um, through storytelling. Um, and so we, we talk about the struggle of, you know, a minority group, right? Just giving one example of, of, of a group that we would, we would, minorities, gender, racial, also neurodiverse, neurodivergent, right? So like we, we talk about them and what they go through as people, but we don't focus on like poor them because they're not, they're actually incredible, talented, creative people who have something to offer, so much to offer um, the world. And, and it's through their stories that help uplift, you know, empower every, everyone else. So it is, it's hard, it's a slow, slow burn for us, but yeah, I just refuse to do it any other way. If we just have to stay small, we'll stay small until, until something, something, you know, until we get bigger. Yeah. That, 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 that's a great point because I think like, you know, when we talk about like nonprofits, you know, or like mission driven work or whatever, a lot of times I think we talk about nonprofits, but they like foundations or whatever, raising money for a good cause. And a lot of us have worked in, when we say nonprofits, that's like associations, you know, the professional associations and you're kind of like, all right, it's kind of, it's mission driven work. They have a mission and all that, but at the same day, at the end of the day, they also represent the professionals 
who are members of them. And so it's, a lot of times it's hard, like you're like, okay, well, what are those, as Arabella said, like, you know, there's not many stories that are like sad stories that are gonna get like donations. And so we use data in like a different way that, you know, and we kind of, we pick what pick and choose what we do. And, it, and we kind of make that, those decisions about, you know, how are we gonna frame this content? You know, are we gonna go down that route? of knowing what gets eyeballs and gets detention for us. And, you know, and that, that brings in that, that, you know, brings in that net, those necessary resources that keep the lights on every day. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think what Chelsea said, like, you know, I think most of us try to do the right thing. And I think there's a lot of time, and this is, this is a, a good reason why always never make these decisions in a vacuum, always run them by people. Uh, have like a committee or a department because there's always someone that says like, yeah, that's not a good idea or that's not who, that's not what our brand is about, you know? Um, and so if you have those people there who are not afraid to speak up or kind of like be those, those checkpoints for you, um, I think that that's the best route to go in, in regards to navigating ethics and data with uh, your nonprofits or, or, or if you're a private company, you have mission driven work, same thing. Yeah, I think that was something um, Arabella mentioned earlier as well, like being in um, in doing uh, journalism and having those checks and balances, even though it's a slower process, um, that she felt it was um, more objective in that at least you would have all those like um, sort of those checkpoints to make sure your work is correct before going out um, and how a lot of sort of as communications work has been democratized. Um, those checks have been lost um, and then sort of new metrics and new ways to uh, qualify that work uh, has come up, whether it's in sort of a reach in terms of like just how many people are seeing it or in the number of clicks. Um, and in that sense, I feel like different types of media, different types of communications, different types of stories that we're telling, um, there are so many different ways and to, to qualify it, like those metrics are abound. Um, so I guess another question I wanted to pose to you all is, um, as you've been uh, doing this type of work, how have you seen um, like focusing on those different method metrics change or different methods to sort of understand your storytelling change? Um, so yeah, that is, that is my question. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. I'm not sure if I'll, if I will totally answer you, Chelsea, but you know, with this all, what I'm just kind of thinking about is the fact that even the type of the presentation of data has changed. So for instance, when, when we've been taught, as we've been talking about negative storytelling versus positive storytelling, one data point that has come up a lot in discussions with uh, the nonprofits we work with um, is uh, the imagery that they're putting forward. And is that a data point, a qualitative data point in the, the type of uh, imagery? So for instance, um, I believe it's Charity Water. They will refuse to show a negative picture of a picture of, you know, a village without water or that is struggling, but instead shows the joy of when that uh, community receives the help that they need to be able to have fresh water in their community and how that, in, you know, the, that sparks a joy within that community and helps them to thrive, right? And so from a data perspective, it just seems to me that there's, there's so many more ways to get and communicate a data point or a, or tell a story through a type of data that is beyond the usual graph or the number percentage, or even to your point, the qualitative, the quote, or the the um, the one person client story that's being shared. Uh, but in to Arabelle's point, it's that slow burn. Is if you continue to show images of individuals or continue to tell stories of people that. Um, are to invoke pity or remorse or guilt or sadness, what are you slowly doing to those individuals in those communities? And is that ethical for the short-term gain of funding? And I, you know, I, I know that we're having this discussion between us, but I will say like the comments in the chat are just phenomenal. And one that I wanna 
raise up is this thing going back to funding and you know nonprofits traditionally not having a voice going to their funders or dictating to their funders what is ethically sound when communicating data or communicating what their organization is doing and the need for nonprofits to have more of a voice uh, in the type of funding they're receiving, the type of data they're being, to, being told to collect. And I think Courtney made the point also, being given the operational funding to be able to collect that data in an ethical manner. Uh, so I just wanted to also bring in those points that I think that they were phenomenal ones. I, I love that, Jamie. And, you know, it reminds me, um, one of the things that I would suggest for any nonprofit, but especially small nonprofits is to create a brand and editorial guide right from the get-go. Oh, they're on mute. <laughs> but yeah, it's exactly, um, you know, and I think, and we actually modeled our brand guide um, after Charity Waters brand guide, because they just, they're just, it's just so tight, right? It's just a tight, tight, tight piece of a document that helps not just your team communicate what your values are, uh, you know, what, what for whatever storytelling they're trying to create and whatever content they're trying to create, but it also helps your community communicate what your values are and whatever they're trying to share as well about you. And that's a, you know, that's that's just a good place to to start. And um, you know, even a one person shop could start doing that, and it's a good like exercise. Um, a good exercise for yourself too on um, like why you're doing something and why are you part of you know why are you doing this and why are you part of this movement that you're trying to push out there that's that's a great example I I, I love that it, it kind of reminds me when I was like years ago when I was a student at the university like I would if I'd write a paper I was like on my monitor I put like a post-it note with like the thesis Right there, so I always like saw kind of what the, what it is, you know, like it was kind of like my guidelines for that, for that, um, it was my touch point. So everything, all roads kind of led there. But I love what you're talking about about these guidelines because I think that a lot of us, whether we're nonprofit or you know private, we have we know we like to use like different methods of content marketing. I think, um, and so we'll produce content and put it out there. Um, and I think I brought this up, I think a few weeks ago when um, we had a pre-call with a, a meet and greet with the, the panelists here. Um, but, you know, I've been with companies before where like, you know, the data will determine what that content is. Um, I think Arabella brought up, you know, um, um, I can't remember if Arabella, Arabella or Jamie brought up about um, kind of like the tone of the content, like what gets, you know, the algorithm favor certain certain types of like of content. And so I think that when you have editorial guidelines in place, um, you know, regarding tone and content and substance and, you know, who that brand is, like, it kind of like, it, it's kind of like those guard guardrails that kind of like keep you right on track, you know, so you, you won't go down that path um, and, and won't go out like kind of seeking those, those, those metrics that mean really to mean nothing, you know, um, in the end, but like, you know, they may please certain, certain individuals, but in the end, they, they they're, they're hurtful for your brand. Um, and that's a story into itself, right? Looking at opportunity in that, right? So we know that the sad stories and the sad imagery sometimes is what is on the clickbait or what attracts people. But I think that when you take the time to put your values on paper or you know in writing and share those with your supporters and your audience and your funders and your board, you are actually you are spreading that ethical data collection and storytelling philosophy to others and in turn educating them on how uh, telling it a different way would be is detrimental to the people that you're actually trying to help and serve. Um, so it's it I know it can be also a very powerful tool that can help further your mission in many ways and um, you know, help people uh, support you even more by applauding your stance and you staying true to your mission and your values as an organization. Yeah, and on that note, I wanted to bring up something um, that this conversation just reminded me of. 
um, was that um, a lot of what I studied in university was about rhetoric. Um, and about sort of um, persuasive elements in, in all the communications that we that we have. Um, and I think we're kind of touching on those sort of uh, points that I remember from those rhetoric classes in that like in in a lot of modern rhetorical studies, um, it's not only sort of what's in the writing that that persuades people, but whether it's in the data or in the imagery, um, as Jamie mentioned with charity water, that sort of visual rhetoric of like, if you're putting these images out, um, what is sort of the impact of it? Um, that That's sort of across the board for all these different sort of media and communications components. Um, and sort of the frequency, the consistency, all those are different sort of variables in how we communicate. And I think um, you all mentioning that brand guide is a really interesting way to think about sort of that, um, that internal rhetoric um, as communications people, as storytellers, um, thinking about what I'm putting out there and really trying to have a checklist of like, I'm putting these things out there for these reasons. And then when you're going back to look at the impact of your work, when you're collecting whatever metrics it might be to seeing if it aligns, I think it's a very interesting way to go about um, uh, evaluating communications, evaluating based off of those values, that checklist. Um, and, and thinking about that um, lasting impact, um, not just sort of like how many clicks do I get right now, but across the board, if I'm putting out 10 pictures um, of this exact same sort of uh, feeling for, for like a month, how is that actually like a changing the story of my brand? Yes, and I have a, I have a little like secret model that I wanna share to everyone. It's not secret, it's actually, I, it's, I'm gonna, I'm taking, you know, the, the, the tried and true um, things from filmmaking, like screenwriting really specifically, and, and what makes a screenplay. It's, 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 a, it's formulaic and it goes all the way to the Iliad, right? It's the, it's the hero's journey. And so at the end of it all, if you really have like, <laughs> you just wanna be telling a story, think about the hero's journey. How has your hero, where did your hero start? What did they have to go through to experience the change? And I'm telling you, it works all the time. It, I, I, and I, I didn't even realize this. Um, we did 2,500 hours of, of conversations in just in 2020. And that was, uh, Tony was part of that. Maybe not 2,500 hours. I think it was minutes. Look, I'm getting my data confused already. But it was a lot of conversations, right? I mean, we spoke to over 70 people last year. That's more than one a week, right? And so I, I, and from there, I realized, you know, these long conversations may not be enough to move people, but when you put it on this sort of narrative construct and it's, and it's there, it's proven, the narrative construct of the hero's journey, how did this hero, your person, your constituent that you serve, right, as for a nonprofit, how did they change over the course of time because of your help? And also because of all the other things they've experienced. So that was like, oh, wow, this is great. So now we're just applying all of that to, to the work that we're doing. Um, I was also, uh, when, as we were talking, I was also thinking about the fact that, and you kind of were, I think getting to this Arabella is looking at it looking at how the story you're telling across multiple stories and the patterns that exist in the audience's response and just reminds me how critical it is to continue to do those A-B tests and to test out uh, different ways of telling your data story. Uh, and, uh, you know, if it, if it is, and maybe it is in a way that isn't sitting well with your values, but does that get more attention and then figuring out how do you change that to be more in line? How do you change that story to be more in line with your values, but still not lose that audience engagement or audience support? And sometimes I think we forget that we, we maybe we've gotten in this um, kind of situation where we continue to tell that story that's not sitting right in our gut or sitting right with our employees, or uh, but we're afraid to go in the other direction, and so. I just encourage people that are in that spot to maybe 
do some tests um, and you know take those one variable shifts to see if they can shift that narrative to be more in line with what resonates with them on an ethical level. Uh, and so you have some data to prove that it can be a more positive story or it can be a more uh, transparent story to that audience without you know you losing the support that you're trying to maintain. I think that's a good overall philosophy to always be testing uh philosophy and i think that once you kind of develop that culture with your with your team um uh, with your company with your department um you're always armed with the, the right ammunition to because i think that a lot of times there's you know some of the decisions that take place above you you know that are made for you they're they're based off a of legacy something that we were we, that company or that apartment was doing five years ago ten years ago no one's ever kind of challenged it um, and so that that's that's when data is kind of used for for good, um, so to speak. I think that a lot of times we talk about you know us using data and chasing the big numbers, but a lot of times there's like that time those times where we don't use data, we don't or we don't have enough data, or we didn't present the right data to those people to make those decisions. So um, so yeah, I love that philosophy. Always be testing. And it reminds me of uh, the lean startup model. You know, uh, having worked for startups in tech, I mean they're. They, these founders, right? Small teams, they, they have an idea, they have a feature in mind, they put it out there and then they test it and then they, then they tweak it from there. And, you know, um, I mean, it, it took us years to arrive to where, where our messaging with, with we excel, even if we're a small team, but we're still, you know, we're constantly, it's never, it's always fluid. It's constantly, we're constantly working at, working at it and then, you know, and, and, and seeing what, what is best. And, you know, one of the other things that I wanted to bring up is like, we, we wanted to do a storytelling workshop for a large company. They really loved us. They're like, oh, we love what you're doing. We love what you're doing with the platform that you're using. Um, and then they come back to us, but you know what? We really just wanna work with a diversity organization just for Asian Americans. And I'm like, wait, what? Cause it was for their Asian Americans employee groups. And I said, but I'm Asian American. <laughs> <laughs> and also the storytelling education is for everyone. That's the point. Like we're not, we're not trying to tackle uh, diversity in silos, which it's mostly is tackled. And, um, and there was just no talking around it. Sometimes the world is just not ready for your idea and that's okay. And if the data shows that the world is not ready for your idea, you have a decision. You keep at it or you let it go. And, you know, and that's one of the hardest decisions to make. It's just, you start realizing it's like, well, you're gonna stick to your guns. That's how you're gonna change the world. You're raising a good point, Arabella, because it, you know what you're also talking about, and I think Robert, you brought this up as decisions being made for you on a legacy front is the importance of being able to use data to tell stories internally to your decision makers and your stakeholders that can change, that have the power to change the course of the way things are done. And it, it really just drives home that we all have a role to play in being able to tell a good story with data behind it. And that it's a, it's a, it's a skill that you need to develop as a professional if you are going to uh, you know, move your organization forward and do good. It, it's almost like you have, we have, uh, we have a moral responsibility to tell stories ethically with ethical data, but you also, uh, it's almost like you're ethically responsible to be able to tell stories uh, inside your organization as well. And that can be a really hard skill to learn, especially if you don't have anyone around you that can mentor you or guide you through that process. Yeah, I think that, yeah, that's like overall great points. Um, um, and I think that, I think, like I was saying, like, just kind of like, um, again, what you were saying about the you know, legacies and decisions and all that, I think that what's that, what, what's that saying, like how we, and I, this goes for our companies as well, because a lot of the people who are in high positions, they were there when, quote, the company was in the good old days or whatever. Like they, they literally put the past on a pedestal and they, they demonize the future. They don't want to like know how we move that company to the next level, this organization or whatnot. And so um, the way I've gotten around it 
you know, especially when I was, you know, not, a, you know, uh, less senior, I had a less senior role was I would literally just like every week I would send kind of like a roundup of that metrics to my SVP on say it was like so, social media ads. And I, and I would put like the kind of like high level data points and I put like my, my takeaways or how I interpreted them. And eventually, you know, sometimes she she would scan, or you you know, or just like to totally delete my emails. But sometimes she would actually read them, and sometimes she would follow up with like, "What do you mean by this?" And you know, it was those when those were like those are kind of spark these conversations because she had the influence with the higher ups that I didn't, and so that's the way I did that. I just did it every single Monday. I had a recap of the of the metrics, um, and I I see this I see that I see a couple people. It, couple people in my current company do that with their and like I think it's it's great I didn't tell them to do it they just do it I think it's one of those things some people do naturally um, but if you're not doing it and you want to make a change and you you have access to all this data and you're an expert in it you you look through it every week I would encourage you to do that you know just it, it's one way just kind of get you know making sure that you know it, it doesn't take long to send an email and for leaders to not make assumptions. So I'll give an example, you know, in my business line where I sit, we have a business line that's 0% uh, we of our uh, referrals are for this business line. And that looks really bad. What aren't you doing performance wise? There's a huge story behind that and being able and by leaders asking, well, what's the story behind this data point? Why is this the way it is? You're giving your employees the opportunity to share something that they see in their work that can help help you guide your decision making and taking that externally, right? We see, you know, X percentage of, you know, violence in this community or that community. If you're working in that community, how many times have we reached out to those community members and asked them to share the story behind that statistic? And you know, it always comes back to somebody was telling me, "Don't assume anything," uh, and that goes with data as well as don't assume anything. Don't create your own story. Get the story from the source, right? And I think that goes into PR and communications and journalism as well as, you know, you get a data point, you want to get it from the source and understand the reason behind it. Yeah, and I, I'm going to give a plug to why it's also, it's important to have a diverse team with diverse perspectives because you, you wouldn't see it that way, right? I, I, I learned from, you know, the, the young people on my team, it's so valuable because I'm like, oh my goodness. Wow, I didn't see it that way. That's incredible that you saw it that way. And they, 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 they will see a piece of data and they'll like, well, why don't you try it this way? And I'm like, ah, oh, I didn't see that. And I think that's so cool, like Robert, like you're, you're seeing also, you know, the, the junior level people following suit to what you're doing and, 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 and giving their perspective on, uh, you know, on the collection of the data. Yeah, absolutely. And um, just kind of taking everything that you've shared and thinking about it. Um, I think we're, we're really talking about sort of uh, intentionality in a lot of our work and really going into our work, know, knowing what values we want to uphold. Um, because it's, it's easy enough to say we want to do the right thing, but thinking about what the right thing means for my organization, for me as a person, for my team, uh, that takes a lot of uh, foresight and a lot of intentionality. Um, and as Jamie has mentioned, and all of us have mentioned, a lot of testing and iterating. Um, Arbella, you mentioned like the lean model for startups, like that's all about uh, iteration, right? Like testing something, breaking it, trying again. Um, and I think that goes hand in hand with the other uh, thing that we started to mention was precedence. Um, for people who do have the ability to influence, how can you set a precedence to give initiative to the junior members of the team? Um, and how can junior members of the team um, see opportunities and try to set a precedence um, for other members of the team to do the same? And how can we sort of share that sort of um, internal storytelling culture? Um, so that's something I've, I'm taking from, from your conversations that I really think are, are very insightful um, and, and comes from your professional experiences. Um, I want to also give a shout out to the older uh, uh, people on my team who have consulted me and the wisdom that they've brought in that also was like, oh, actually, in terms of wisdom, 
the like you know my my, my Mark Combs um, uh, volunteer consultant. Uh, he has been David Jacobson. He's been great in giving me you know guidance on 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 ethical storytelling. So you know just gotta give that shout out to the older generation as well. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think we're actually coming to time. I think this hour has flown by and I've really enjoyed uh, hearing everyone's conversations. Um, I'm going to share screen again really quickly um, to lead us through a quick uh, wrap up. Uh, so here we are. Um, again, I wanna thank you the speakers for your time today, for, for bringing in your wisdom, bringing in your experience to share with us all um, and, and just, having a great conversation. Um, for anyone who would love to continue this conversation, I've been checking the chat and there's been lots of uh, amazing insights there as well. Uh, PT here, we have a uh, professional networking group. Uh, it's a closed moderated group in which we want to um, have more of these conversations to share more of these stories um, and to ask these type of questions. Um, you can also find more about PT Kale on our LinkedIn page. Um, for everyone who is at this event, as well as anyone who has RSVP'd, if you know someone who RSVP'd and weren't able to make it, we'll be sending up follow-up emails um, with a survey to see what other things you'd be interested in us hosting uh, related to these topics of data ethics, um, of storytelling, of really thinking about how we can use the data on hand more um, effectively, but not only effectively, but to fit the values that we have.